two experiments so far. First of all, um, let me um, briefly tell you that four large-scale negative income tax experiments have uh, taken place in the United States between 68 and uh, 1980. So a negative income tax is a form of basic income guarantee. Uh, these experiments, and you see the list here, were uh, initi initiated by the federal administration and at the time they were seen as a, really a, a major landmark in social research. And basically what happened is that household, households were assigned to groups enjoying the benefit of a negative income tax um, and for, for a number of years and other households were, were assigned to control groups that continued living under existing arrangements. So a few details about the, the experiments, and if you want to know more, you can also ask uh, Carl Lodequist, who must be here somewhere in the room, he's there. Carl is really the expert on NIT experiments in the US. Uh, the amount that was paid to households were um, ranged mostly from 50% to 150% of the official poverty line at the time. So you see one example here in the uh, New Jersey experiment. Uh, there was a clawback rate, so and a negative income tax is not exactly a basic income, there is a clawback rate uh, which then ranged from 30% to 70% in these experiments. And important, the duration of the experiments, uh, the payment was limited in time between two and nine years. And the main goal of the experiments was to uh, try to assess, to estimate, to measure the impact of a guaranteed income, of a negative income tax here in this case, on various indicators, but above all on labor supply. So um, basically to check whether recipients of a guaranteed income would work less, uh, would reduce their working time, or, or perhaps even stop working altogether. And basically, among the most, the most uh, discussed effects was a reduction in the labor supply, a modest but real reduction in the labor supply of secondary earners. And this reduction was modest, but still it contributed to killing for many years the political attraction of basic income type proposals in the US. There was also a negative income tax experiment in Canada uh, I'm just mentioning it uh, here, it's quite interesting, and if you want to know more about that one, you shouldn't ask Carl, but you should ask Evelyn Forges, you should just Google her name and you, you'll find very interesting research, recent research on this uh, Canadian experiment. Right, so basic income experiments, so here we're switching to a real basic income, not a negative income tax, are, uh, as far as I know, more recent. Uh, some basic income experiments took place or are taking place at this moment. One of them will be discussed by Guy Standing uh, in a moment. It's the experiment that he, he has led in uh, India. Uh, there was also, some of you have heard of it, a um, basic income experiment in Namibia, in the village of Ochivero, where uh, uh, households, uh, individuals, were um, paying, were paid, sorry, $8 a month between Namibian, Namibian dollars, uh, no, US dollars, here it's in US dollar, between 2008 and 2009. Uh, another example is uh, Give Directly, which is uh, an American charity, has decided to launch a uh, basic income experiment in Kenya. Uh, um, you have the amount here. And finally, uh, there will be an experiment, in, a basic income experiment in Uganda, uh, in 2017, it should start in January 2017, uh, and if you want to know more about that experiment, you have the website here, uh, and it's launched by a Belgian NGO called AID. So that's very quickly the experiment so far. So you had negative income tax experiments in the US and Canada, and basic income experiments, essentially, as you can see, in uh, developing countries. Now, as you might know also, there is a huge discussion at this moment in OECD countries about pilots and experiments. Jürgen will say more about Finland. Uh, there is a discussion also in the Netherlands. Alexander will say more about that in Canada. So some people say that the, prov uh, the province of Ontario is, going, is about to launch a, a pilot too. But at this stage, the experiments that took place were mostly experiments in uh, developing countries. 
And then my second point, uh, uh, briefly again, uh, why we should remain cautious about experiments. I'm just going to, to mention a few limitations that we should keep in mind when we discuss them, even if I think that they can be useful. First of all, always remember that these experiments are of limited duration. And yet, the effect, the impact of a basic income is bound to be quite different, depending on whether I expect it to last forever, for my whole life, or only for a few years. So, um, um, so for instance, in the NIT experiments in the US, mostly people were paid for uh, three years, on average, three years. So obviously, this is anticipated by the subjects, and they know that the experiment will end. So it will, of course, this very idea will affect their uh, behavior on the labor market. Perhaps because they will stay, they will keep that job because they know that the experiment will end, or perhaps because they want to save the opportunity and think it's now or never, so I leave my job. So this is bound to have an impact, um, and we, we should certainly keep that, uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so depending on whether it's um, for life or for one year. Second limitation we should uh, keep in mind, I think it's a very important one, Experiments uh, are always funded, say, from the outside. So not from within the community that enjoys the benefit of the basic income or the negative income tax. Basically, uh, for instance, in India, uh, perhaps a guy can say more on that, or in Namibia, it came from uh, sources from, from the Western world, uh, from UNICEF. In the NIT experiments in the US, Funding came from research organizations and the federal government. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to switch to the third one in my conclusion. So we have to keep that in mind. Why? Because in the real world, some people will have to pay. Some people will perhaps, they will see their tax rates go up and will have to contribute to the scheme. This is very different from an experiment. Last limitation, small size of the sample relative to the labor market, experiments only affect a few hundreds of thousands or of individuals in a labor market of several millions. So the impact on the labor market, you cannot really measure it in an experiment. What will happen? Some jobs might disappear, some jobs might be uh, created, you cannot really measure that in a small sample. And I, a brief conclusion of the brief overview. <coughs> experiments, despite their limitations, might make sense, I think, for several reasons, I take two of them. They can boost awareness of the ID and discussions about its pros and cons, and we see that already with the Finnish and the Dutch experiments. The Finnish experiment has not started yet, and, and, and yet uh, it's all over the place in the press and the media in, in Europe. And secondly, I also think that it, it allows us to observe some interesting micro-effects. I would call them micro-effects, and what I mean by that is is, uh, I'll take one last example, for instance, the impact on the dignity of recipients. Um, we know that NIT experiments in the US and in Canada had an impact on their self-esteem, and I finish with a quote from a recipient of the Mincom experiment in Canada, where he said, I like Mincom in that one is left alone, never harassed or made to feel like you have to crawl to receive an almighty dollar. And this is, of course, exactly one of the reasons why we want a basic income. Thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Yannick. Uh, <laughs> um, let me just say that this is a subject that, over the years, I've had uh, mixed feelings about. I've devoted 12 years of my life to designing, conducting, and analyzing pilots. I've got many scars from doing that. They are politically very complicated. They involve raising money from diverse sources. They involve being out in tricky circumstances. We had a very famous Belgian professor who tried to sabotage our main pilot. We had a deal with Brits being, <laughs> being thrown through the window. He's not here today, fortunately, that Belgian 
thing, but I had to threaten him that I would report him. I would report him if he did any more sabotage. The, so we had to cope with the political constraints that I would never have fully anticipated. I'm the only one here who's been stupid enough to do pilots, basic income pilots. And I've been involved in four of them, okay? The first one was the Namibian one, and I disagreed with the methodology. But I think the people who were leading it uh, were well-intentioned, and the results, I think, have a certain validity, even though the randomistas would not approve. What we did in India, the first pilot, while we were dealing with the politics and dealing with the Gandhis and the Congress Party and the bureaucrats and the IMF and the World Bank and so on, we did a pilot in West Delhi where 450 households were given the choice of either continuing with the subsidized food and kerosene under the public distribution system or to have a basic income of equivalent value, monetary value. And the principal result I mention here is that we were facing an environment where that Belgian <coughs> professor and a lot of other people were saying people preferred the subsidies to the cash. And they were saying it loudly and stridently in the press and everywhere. Well, when we did it, it turned out that about half and half started, and after about three months of the pilot, people were queuing up to try and change from the subsidies into the cash. By the experiment, we couldn't allow that, but the data showed clear preference for shifting to the cash instead. And there were good reasons, diets improved and things like that, that the results are, are fairly clear. But then, of course, we've been designing our major pilot, which has a number of unique features. And I think, maybe wrong, that this is genuinely the first pilot of a basic income with the properties of a basic income. Because it was universal. Everybody in the community received it. It was cash. It was individual. It was unconditional and it was non-withdrawal. You recognize those features? That's what we believe. So it was a basic income, and we tried, and we did, a randomized control trial methodology, but not along the random meters specific designs, because you can't do that with a social policy. We well, can with a malaria pill, or an AIDS pill. You can give him one, him a placebo, and him nothing, and you test the effects, right? If you do something like that in a village, and I give you and your next door neighbor doesn't get one, very quickly you're going to get the knock on the door, you better share it or else, right? So you can't do with that sort of thing. What we did was nine areas, everybody, every man, every woman, every child received a basic income, 13 areas, Nobody received a basic income. And in addition, that's, we did the tests. Now, you have to do a very, very complex methodology if you're doing a pilot, because you have to do a census beforehand. You then have to do an interim impact surveys of what, after six months, what's, what's happening. Then you have to do further surveys, and then you do further surveys. We did that. And you're not just testing bloody labor supply. You're also testing the effects on nutrition, on schooling, on health, on people's attitudes, OK? So your methodology has to be very carefully designed. We spent ages on that. And we did the series. And we have millions of digits of information. We produced the book. And if anybody's interested, I've got a few copies here on the results, and we got a huge technical report, and we've got a number of articles coming out. Now, that survey has now, the first time ever such a project, and I agree with your sort of limitation issues, of course, but we're in the field now doing what I've called, we 
don't have to call it this, but I've called it a legacy survey. In other words, two and a half years after it stopped, right, we're out in the field in those villages seeing what have been the longer term things that have been retained and what sort of things have been lost in recidivism. Now, just very, very briefly, and anybody who can see this, the books and the, the articles, and there are videos, there are a number of videos that you could see, if those of you haven't seen, the first set of effects were welfare effects. Improved nutrition, improved sanitation, improved health care, and improved schooling attendance and performance. Those are the welfare effects. Too few pilots have actually looked at those things. They're rather fundamental. The second are equity effects. We couldn't have predicted some of those things, but for example, the disabled, that woman on the front of the book, disabled benefited far more than anybody else. And women benefited far more than men, and the frail benefited more than the able-bodied. The third effect were the economic effects, because what we saw was an increasing economic activity, economic production, and an increase in work. But if you use the methodology used in the MINCOM and the NIT experiments, you would not have seen that increase of work, because they asked about main activity. The big changes were people taking second activities and third activities, diversifying their economic activity. Are you surprised? So the methodology, if you'd used a conventional labor force approach, you wouldn't have picked up what was happening. That was the sort of dynamic effect. The only group for which labor declined, <clears throat> it's a major drawback of our pilots, was children. And they were going to school more, that's the reason. So they weren't doing so much labor. If anybody's upset like that, then that's, that's sad. The final thing is the most important of all. And that is, the basic income was shown, and we didn't predict this, even though our, our data are very conclusively, that the emancipatory effect of the basic income was much greater than the monetary value. I could explain that at length, I won't, but it's an extraordinary finding. The emancipatory value is greater than the monetary value. And that is basically because in the communities like we were dealing with, Money is a scarce commodity. And any scarce commodity, if it drives up the price, you lower the price of the money lenders and all sorts of other things by in inducing extra liquidity. So the transformative effect overall of the community, which you cannot pick up with an individualized sam random sample, but you have a community effect, was quite dramatic. And you see that in, in the book. So for me, and I have to stop now, but for me, one of the most important things you do with a pilot is you refute prejudices. You deal with low-hanging fruit. You, you find out that the work issue is not the major one. You find out that the emancipation is great. That sort of thing you have to learn by a pilot. And the final, final point is this. Pilots are a way of political legitimation at this particular time in our debate. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Fine. Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, um, thanks very much for inviting me here. Since we're celebrating 30th anniversary, um, this is really great. So I'm very much enjoying this. I've been doing this for a while as well. So. First conference was Luke and Robert in Amsterdam, and since then I've kind of been hanging around this topic. <laughs> and it actually made me think, where did I get this income from? And surprise, surprise, as a Belgian, I didn't get it from Philippe. I actually got it from Walter Van the <laughs> first time around. So, well done. Yeah. Yeah. so the man sitting very quiet in the middle, <laughs> he has some responsibility, nevertheless. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll be talking about Finland. Um, one very, very important thing, I'll actually be, be mentioning a lot of things that Guy has already hinted at as well. So there are, there are things that you will see moving from one experiment to another that 
raise similar issues. But it's also very, very important to be aware of the differences. Doing a pilot or an experiment in India is going to raise a whole set of hurdles and results and so on and so forth. They're very different from Finland. And that's one of the reasons why experiments in different jurisdictions are really, really very interesting, right? So something to kind of put out um, from the very start. Uh, basically, Finland had about 25 years debate on basic income. That's a lot. There's a huge amount of information. I'm going to literally just start with what's happening now. So I apologize for anyone who wanted a bit of an overview. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to do that. So the starting point for me is May 2015, when the new Finnish government, coalition government, announced in the government program that they were going to do an experiment. So here is, and this is the reason I want to put up the slide. This is something that you have to keep in mind when you think about experiments in Finland. So this is basically the sort of distribution of the political parties. This is a static view, an average if you want, of their views on basic income over the last 25 years. Right? So what's important here? Number three, the center party, prime minister's party, in favor. Number four and five, the coalition government partners, not so much. In fact, one of them, National Coalition Party, very much not in favor at all. So this is an important political context. We're talking about a government that's running this experiment where basically inside the government a lot of stuff is happening, right? So the politics of this is a lot complicated. And to put this very clear, the prime minister has been initiating this um, pilot slash experiment. The person responsible for it, the minister responsible for it, for social affairs, is from the True Finns party. And then another very key important minister, the finance minister responsible for the taxation side, is from the National Coalition Party. So you can see some of the complications already arising, right? So um, with that in mind, so what's been happening? So we had the announcement of the government. A couple of months later, the government decided, OK, we're going to have a big research consortium group examining what's been happening out there already with experiments and what are the particular constraints, doing micro simulation, doing polling, doing surveys, doing a lot of analysis of coming up with a proposal for doing an experiment. This is really a very large consortium. I mean, we're talking about multiple departments and universities, think tanks, and so on and so forth. It's coordinated by KELA, which is the social insurance institution of Finland. And we've released a preliminary report uh, in March, which basically came up with a whole range of, of recommendations. And if you're interested, you can find it on the KELA website. We actually sort of came up with practical recommendations, but nevertheless sort of ideal scenarios of the sort of things we wanted to do. That went to the government, and basically the result of this, which was announced at the end of August, was that they basically pretty much ignored what we recommended. So the proposal at the moment is very much basic income light. It's a lot more minimal version than what we recommended, and we being you know, the whole group. And as you can imagine, this caused a lot of disappointment, a lot of criticism, uh, you know, and it ranges from people who are mildly disappointed to people who think that, you know, this is utterly stupid and we should just leave all this. So what I basically want to do, I want to very briefly tell you what the design is at the moment, what we're planning on doing. I want to tell you what are the constraints, I mean, why in some sense, this is just not a con this is not a government conspiracy, as some people seem to think, right? There are actually some really practical constraints, and they're very helpful in terms of thinking about seeing experiments in the real world. It's one thing to think about this on paper. It's a very different thing if you actually have to implement an experiment in a practical context. And Guy has given you some indications of difficulties in India. We have the same thing, right? Well, we have slightly different issues, but similar problems. And finally, why do I think it's still worthwhile doing this? You know, I mean, if it's such a bad design, if it's such a restricted version, why should we bother? Okay, so number one, what is actually going to happen? Or, you know, what is the proposal? Well, in a nutshell, the experiment will start in January 2017. The government is adamant that this will start. It will be for two years. Why does it have to start? Because two years and then six months later there will be an election. Very clearly there's a political agenda here, right? This has a problem. 
in the sense that the government will start this pretty much no matter what will start. Okay, so it's more important that something will start than this being the sort of ideal design. Okay, that's a serious constraint. I mean, we don't have anything to say about that, right? So, so what we will have an experiment two years. It will be 560 euros per month. There's been a lot of discussion in media, a lot of figures being put out there. The 560 now seems to be the final version. Why 560? This is very much the minimum that a single person can get in terms of social assistance. So if they don't get any, if they're not eligible for any other supplements, the 560 is the very, very basic package. So we're not going to make anyone worse off, obviously. Okay. But in many ways, we're really giving them the bare minimum. So it will replace two types of social assistance schemes. But on top of that, there will be other schemes that are still in place. And of course, you know, income from work and so on can be kept well, subject to some taxation. So this is very different from what we recommended, because what we recommended initially was actually an experiment with multiple levels. Right? We wanted to actually test various levels and see what happened there. We also wanted to test different taxation models. And this is a very important part of what's proposed now. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to experiment with taxes at all. The tax guys did not want to play along. It's very simple. So tax basically is just going to be capped as it is. And one implication of that is that effectively it's actually a very generous scheme. But it raises all sorts of problems with comparisons, and for sure this is never the sort of scheme that would be implemented because it would be utterly, utterly unaffordable, right? This is one of the criticisms of some of the people, saying that why would you even experiment with this, right? It's never going to be the thing that we're going to implement. It will be around 2,000 people. Initially, we had proposed 8,000 to 10,000, but that was based on multiple models, multiple tax rates, now we're having a simplified model, but 2,000 is all we can afford, really. You know, we have a budget constraint on this, very seriously. More importantly, and more controversially, the 2,000 people are going to be focused. This is not a universal scheme. It's going to be focused pretty much entirely on people who are currently unemployed and in receipt of KELA benefits, these sort of basic social assistance packages. Why? Well, several reasons, really. First of all, the government, and this is an important point, the government in Finland is interested in labor market effects. In fact, that's really what they're interested in. I mean, you know, they're, they're happy for us to play around with some other stuff, but the one thing they want yeah. is to know what happens. I'm already getting done. Yes. Why me? <laughs> labor constraint. Labor constraint, yeah. So, um, so this is an important thing in the sense that this is not a utopian proposal, right? It's very, very sort of restricted. Can I have a minute? Yes. Oh my God. I'm going to have to forget about reflections and things like that. So I'll put those in the question. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. So um, another point. So, so we're talking about a very clear constraint, you know, 25 to 58. So just very briefly, people are complaining. Why not pensioners? Why not students? Isn't it important? Of course it is important if we think about basic income in general. But if you're only worried about labor market effects, that is the constraint we have, right? Another key consideration, well worth mentioning, Kela already has a register of these people. If you think in practicalities, we need to find a way to sample these people. We need to find a way to make this experiment work within the existing framework. Then using the Kela register, so to speak, is easy. It's cheap. It's doable at short notice, but it has some important significations for the type of people you can experiment with. That is partly what explains the limitation. I'll say one final thing and then I'll literally have to go. Uh, we were initially hoping to do a combination of randomized controlled trials, national ones, and this is important to realize. Finland would be the first national experiment. But combined with the sort of experiments that Guy was talking about, having regions where we actually experiment with a lot more saturation rate to get network effects. Again, budget, politics, practical constraints means that we have to leave that. So what will happen is a national, 2,000 people nationally selected across Finland, right? But forget about any network effects whatsoever, right, under these sort of constraints.
Okay, I have loads yeah. more, and you can email me if you want to know more. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Thirty years ago, we had a fierce political and societal discussion in Holland about basic income. There were discussions by ordinary people in political parties everywhere. It was a very principled discussion. Are you in favor or not of receiving income without working? In a very Christian country, so it was a very, you know, say something against the labor ethic. It was a time of a lot of unemployment, so people said we have the right to have this income because there are no jobs anyway, we're against the system, etc. But okay, that debate ended in 1997 in the cabinet of the Dutch government, where the right-wing minister of the right-wing liberals said, Solomon he was the leader of the right-wing liberals, I'm in favor of the basic income. And also the guy, the economic minister from E66, left-wing liberals said, I'm in favor. And then the prime minister, Bill Cox, said, I'm in favor, but now maybe in certain years, and now you stop discussing it. And then the economy turned on, and Unemployment went down and basic income died as a subject. And since three or four years, we have an enormous discussion back in Holland, even bigger scale than that. Why did this discussion come back? Of course, there is the reason that a guy is not here, Rutger Bregman, a young historian, he wrote a book, Gratis Geld, Free Money. That was very influential, and there were a lot of programs in Holland on the Dutch television. But that alone would not have triggered it, this enormous debate we have now. And that is because we also have, we are a rich country like Switzerland too, we also have what Guy calls the precariat. We have 10 million people between 18 and 65. Two million have benefits, one form of another of benefits. And we have two million people who have flex work they have no secure job, very bad bullshit jobs, two million. And then we have one million independent, self-employed. They employ nothing but themselves. So that's almost five million people. And then you have five million people who still have a fixed job, with a fixed contract. And that was, 10 years ago, five and a half million. So they feel the, the, the thrink as well. 30 years ago, you had five years unemployment money. So if you lost your job, you could easily find another. Now, after two years, you have to sell your own house. So also the middle income feels it. And then we talk a lot about the poverty trap. Okay, we know that the unemployed have a poverty trap. Because the Social Democrats especially <coughs> introduced so many income-dependent rules, the middle groups have a, have a poverty trap as well. If you're a policeman, starting policeman, you earn two, two, uh, 26,000 euros a year, and then you start to do overtime, you earn 1,000 euros. In the end, you earn net only 35 euros. So also the middle group feel that they are in the system. And we hand out leaflets to the people. You see that the face in the present system is gone. That's very important. Uh, we were 25 years as a branch of Jim this January, and we asked one of the famous poll guys in Holland to ask the Dutch population, what do they think about basic income? And the question was basic income, and you have to readjust the taxes. So no free money, you have to readjust the taxes. 40% of the population said, yes, it's a good idea. 45% said, no, it's not a good idea. And 15% said, we don't know yet. That's also what we encounter when we go to the public, that some people haven't heard about the idea, but most <coughs> have. And then it was similar like it's in Switzerland. The Green Party vote is 60% in favor, 20% against. The left voters, more than half in favor, and a minority against. The right-wing voters, right-wing liberals from our prime minister, three quarters against. Christian Democrats are 60% against. And then, and that's different from Switzerland, the voters from Wilders, from our extreme right party, 37% in favor, 
so not 10% like in Switzerland, but 37%, and about 40% against, and a lot don't know in that category. So that's very interesting politically. Now about the experiments. There have been a political struggle for two years to get these experiments going. And just yesterday the cabinet finally decided that the four communes who want to do these experiments may go ahead. And not only the four, others can go ahead as well. And that's <coughs> important. So it's Utrecht. And if you want to know more, you ask Luc Groot because he's conducting. Raise your hands so people can ask you questions. Because they have a very complicated system. There's, I think, six different groups of 50 people who all fall to a different regime. And the most interesting part is if you're alone, you get 9,600 euros in Holland if you're alone. And they're allowed to earn 2, euro, sorry, 200 euros per month extra. When I was unemployed, it was basically the same in the 80s. But the interesting thing is it will go ahead. And then my last point. It's back on the political agenda, even on the government level. If I may lend your book. Kai gave a presentation in Dresden for Bilderberg conference. And our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, out of himself, came to Kai standing and said, I want to have your book. I want to read about it. And it's important because our Prime Minister has been Prime Minister two times and he wants to become a third time as well. And he knows he needs four political parties to form a government because of the Senate. So he has to deal with the Greens or the Social Democrats again or the Latvian Liberals in order to form a government. And he knows that in those parties the basic income is a lively idea and a well debated. So he has to prepare himself. We had a political budget debate uh, two weeks ago, no, one week ago, and he was asked by the leader of the Animal Rights Party, basic income is a good idea, don't you think so? And then he said he had been around because when he was young, the use of the right-wing liberals were in favor of the basic income. But he, his political answer was, no, I'm against, first from liberal reasons, because then everybody becomes dependent on the state, and as a liberal, I'm against. And then they said, I'm against because it will complicate the existing system. That also, of course, depends on the level. But he did not say you can't afford it. It's not a, and that is the question we most encounter when we talk to people and also to politicians. Oh, it's a very pragmatic discussion now. It's a good idea. How are you going to afford it? Which level? So another guy in the parliament from another party and he will go to the elections to March next year with a basic income scheme. And he said, I'm in favor of a basic income. And all the other parties ask him then, yeah, OK, but at what level? So he was forced to show his calculations. And then the debate was stopped and will go on later. And he said, here, 800 euros, it cost 130 billion euro, and it's financeable. So that is the level of discussion in Holland. How do you finance it? As a branch of Gen, we have discussions with people from all different Excellent. political perspectives, how to, yeah, just one thing, how to calculate it. And now we're plugging in in the Social Democrats, the Greens, and the left wing liberals in their national programs that there should be a national experiment worth 40 million to look for the poverty trap and for health. Because Canada, it was a clear benefit, 8.5% less health cost, and health is the most important item of the present election elections. Thank you.